Okay, guys. So, Roosevelt has been elected in the election of 1932. The New Deal's underway. The Emergency Banking Act has gone down. And Roosevelt begins to talk about the three R's. Three R's. Three words that begin with the letter, letter R that, taken together, form a kind of one, two, three step program for how to save the country from the Depression and get America back on track. The three R's were relief, recovery, and reform. Relief programs and measures were intended to feed people, house people, get medical aid to people. Whatever people needed to be just basically taken care of, that's what relief was all about. Recovery was about getting farming back in business properly, industry back in business properly, banking back in business properly, get the country back up on its feet, recover, right? The country been knocked out. <clears throat> now it's got to climb back up and get back into the fight. Number three, reform. Fixing what was wrong, taking what used to work that sort of fell apart, and reinventing it, right? Change for the better. You know, the United States is a great country. The American system, the American way of life, great. But some things went wrong. There were some flaws. There were some underlying issues with it. Well, we've got to take those things, fix it. We've got to, we've got to reform what wasn't working so that it will work now and on into the future. Right now, if I wanted to really talk about the three R's and all the things that came about as a result of relief programs, recovery programs, reform programs, I could talk for four or five hours. But you don't want that, neither do I. So let's talk about one thing in terms of relief, and that was the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, the FERA. So the federal government says to the state governments, look, we're going to make you a deal. We want you to figure out creative ways, you the people in your state, to make money for relief programs, primarily feeding people, okay? And for every $3 that you can raise, the federal government is going to give you $1. If you raise $300, bucks, we will give you $100. You raise $30,000, we'll give you ten grand. You raise $3 million, we'll give you a million. Under Hoover, the national government had offered to loan the state government's money, but the state governments didn't want to get into further debt. They said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Under FDR, the federal government saying, we're going to give you money, okay? What we're going to do is reward you for being creative. We're going to help you to help yourself. So the state government, by way of the newspapers, they transmit to the local governments, the city governments, right, to everybody in the state, think of ways to generate revenues. Have yard sales, church bazaars, rummage sales, okay? Clear out your garage, your attic, your basement, sell your old stuff you don't need anymore. The money that you make with that, donate it to the FERA fund. You're going to help your state to raise more and more money, and the federal government is going to match you $1 for every three, right? Have a county fair, you know? A bunch of rides and this and that, bake sales and cake walks and all kinds of stuff. Put up a kissing booth with the prettiest girl in town, you know, a dime for a kiss from Betty Lou uh, Stevenson or whatever. The, every guy's going to line up all day long. There's going to be guys lining up to give this girl a kiss. Not, you know, not a big, not making out, but kiss, kissing booth, okay? This is tremendous. It works fantastically because it motivates the American people from the bottom level up to figure out and work on ways to generate revenues to help their fellow Americans. All right. So relief, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. Now, under recovery, I want to talk about one thing in some detail, and that is the AAA, or the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and how it worked. Okay, so what I want you to do first, guys, is look at this diagram that I made for you. I want to teach you something you probably don't know about. Some of you may, who knows. But I want to teach you about crop rotation. Okay, Everything that's grown on a farm anywhere in the world, any crop, takes nutrients out of the soil. But at the same time, plants as they grow, crops as they grow, they give back nutrients into the soil. There's an exchange going on. Sometimes what you can do is you can plant things close together where one crop takes something out of soil and the other crop gives it back. And what the other crop takes out of the soil, the first plant gives it back. So look here. You've got on the left 
one, two, three, four, going around clockwise. This is a farm, let's say a hundred acre farm divided into four parcels. And this farmer grows corn and beans. Okay, so in year one, he's going to grow one corn, two beans, you get the idea, three, four. Okay, the next year, he's going to rotate his crops. Beans are going to go where the corns were. Corn is going to go where the beans were. You see what I'm saying here? It's pretty basic and self-explanatory. By doing this, what the farmer does is he keeps his soil fertile, healthy, vibrant, full of nutrients. If he just grew corn and beans on the same parcel for year in and year out, after a certain number of years, he'd wear out his soil and he wouldn't be able to produce good, healthy crops anymore. Okay, now, because farmers had gotten into such difficulty during the Depression, hopefully you remember this from the book, right? Guys losing their farms, crop prices are down. You know, when they got in financial difficulty, they began to farm over, they began to over farm their land. Let me put it that way. Okay, they didn't rotate their crops at all. And this was particularly problematic for farmers that grew things like cotton, for example. Okay, so look here at year one. Here's farmer Bob, let's say. He grows cotton, okay on his farm. Again, four parcels of land. Cotton, 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 and you see on number four it says fallow. Fallow means you didn't grow anything there that year. You just left the land alone, you fertilized it, you treated it in certain ways, but you didn't grow anything on it because you need to let the soil rejuvenate itself. Cotton is one of the crops that takes tremendous amounts of nutrients out of the soil or energy, okay, vitality out of the soil. So you've got to let areas of your cotton growing land or your tobacco growing land or coffee, you've got to leave it alone for a while and allow it to sort of get its act together to get healthy again. So an intelligent farmer who knows what he's doing, he rotates this one crop like so. One, two, three, cotton, four, fallow. Year two, two, three, four, cotton, one, fallow. Year three would be three, four, one, cotton, two, would be fallow. So you do this every year, this keeps your land healthy, great. But remember, farmers got in trouble, so they didn't let anything lie fallow, especially out in the middle of the country where car farmers primarily grew things like wheat and corn, where the Dust Bowl hit. They stopped allowing their land to replenish itself, and they farmed on all the land year after year after year, and they screwed themselves because they produced less and less healthy crops, even though they were planting more and more and more, crop prices are going down, so they need to grow more to get more money to pay their bills. But of course, again, you remember from the book, this didn't work out too well. Okay, so what the Agricultural Adjustment Act proposes, well, and it's going to get passed by Congress, so let's just talk about what it does. Okay, look over here at the left and read along with me. And I've got, I've got corn over here, and I've got cotton in the diagram, and that's just because I'm a damn fool, okay? I, I, I should have had both cotton or both corn, but anyway. Okay, the, the, the AAA passes, and parcels one and two, okay? Farmer Bob is going to sell that at market for whatever the going price is, okay? So let's say that it's corn or cotton, whatever you want, okay? And let's say that it's selling at $1,000 a ton. So at the end of the season, when he harvests his crop, let's look at year one here, okay? Parcel number one, parcel number two, he's going to sell that. A thousand bucks a ton. He gets eight tons. He makes eight thousand bucks. But he filled out paperwork with the AAA that tells him, or that tells them, that he needs to earn $10,000 yearly to survive, to pay the mortgage, to feed the family. He had, he had to prove this with documentation, okay? He's told the government and proven to the government, I need to make ten grand. okay? Well, he's only made 8000 so he's got $2,000 that he's of a shortfall. The federal government will pay him the difference between what he earned for half of his crop and what he needs to earn. In this case, the difference would be $2,000 getting Farmer Bob the $10,000 that he needs. And there's a typo there, the Farmer Bob. I'm going to have to fix that. Okay, anyway, so whatever the farmer, this farmer, that farmer needs to earn, the federal government's going to give him, okay, the difference between what he actually earned and what he needs, all right? Now, this leaves parcel number three, okay? Now, 
Parcel number four is going to lie fallow. Okay, that's part of the agreement. They want the farmers to get back in business properly. So they're not going to grow anything on four this year. But what about what he produces on three? Well, what he does on three, it's going to be destroyed. If it's produce, it's going to be burned. And if it's livestock, it's going to be slaughtered and then burned. Parcel number three is going to be turned over to the federal government, and the federal government is going to destroy that. I know that some of you reading this are shocked because you're thinking there's people going hungry, jobless people who need food, and they're destroying all that food. But you're not seeing the picture right. People were hungry in the U.S. during the Depression, not because there was not enough food produced, but because they didn't have the money to pay for food. What FDR and the New Dealers wanted was to make sure that crop prices would stay high so that farmers could earn a living. And as farmers made more money, they could buy more things. And as more things were sold, the demand would be placed upon American manufacturers to make more things. And that would lead to more employment in the industrial sector. And all of this would lead to more tax revenues, which would in turn allow the government to pay off the debt incurred by all of its spending. Look at it from this angle. The government's paying a lot of money to farmers to help them survive. But the only way that'll work in the long run is if farmers start to pay their own way and no longer need government subsidies. And the only way that works is if prices stay high. If the government had taken all of that extra farm product and sold it at market, the market would have been glutted, prices would have gone down, farmers would be in worse trouble, and it would cost the government more money to help them. Okay? So this is a, how the Agricultural Adjustment Act is going to work. There's a political cartoon on the left where you see this, you know, like this, woman who lives in a city, she's got a little garden in the backyard, she's telling her husband, I think I'll plow under every third parsnip, right? Like she's going to limit her growing, you know, kind of a goof on the, the AAA. And then over here on the right, you see something a little more to the point, which is FDR riding a horse, which is supposed to symbolize Congress, and the horse is balking at the big hurdle, farms, mortgages for farms, the relief bill to deal with farm mortgages. It was very, very difficult to get these farm bills through Congress for a variety of different reasons, okay? Now, why was it hard to get this? I mean, if you stop and think about it for a minute, the AAA sounds pretty awesome. So why was it difficult to get this thing through Congress? Why is it that many farmers were not happy about the prospect of the passage of the Agricultural Adjustment Act? I mean, here you see three farmers marching to protest, and they're sort of like consciously paying homage to the famous Spirit of 76 image of the two drummers and the guy with the flute, right? Now, the guy in the middle's got a sign instead of a flute, and the guy on the right's got, I don't know, it's like a bedroll, a sleeping bag or something that he's got his drumsticks playing on, and the other guy's got a milk can, but you get the idea. What's the problem with the triple A? Okay, well, I want you to think about it this way. Doctors are in the business of healing people, not making people sick. To make someone sick goes completely against the grain of what a doctor is. Farmers, for thousands of years, have been in the business of feeding people. And it goes against the grain, no pun intended, of a farmer to destroy food. Just the basic premise of destroying all that food made people crazy. Two-thirds of the members of Congress were against the AAA to begin with because those men were farmers. Now, you might just say, wait a minute, they're congressmen. How could they be farmers? Okay, yeah, they're members of Congress, but they come from farming families, and they still own in their state, whatever state we're talking about, they own land. Part of the money they make every year comes from the acreage where they grow carrots or corn or tobacco or whatever it is. Farming is in their blood. They are the descendants of generations of farmers. And they say, I'll be damned if I'm going to pass a bill that allows all this good food to be destroyed. They won't do it. FDR is so concerned about this resistance that he pays a special visit to Congress, the crutches and the leg braces, and he you know, makes a speech before Congress saying, gentlemen, we're in a race with the sun. I beg you to pass this act. What does he mean that we're in a race with the sun? Well, when did FDR take office? March of 1933. When is it that farmers plant their crops? March, April, May, depends on what part of the country, but spring, like soon, like right away, like really quickly. If they can't stop the farmers from planting a lot, 
And then they're going to overplant for yet another year, and there's going to be one more disastrous year for farming. So FDR is saying we're in a race with the sun, gentlemen. I implore you to make a decision and move on this. Well, ultimately they did, but almost too late. Hundreds of federal agents traveled through the worst parts of the country where the, where the farming was in the worst shape, and they told farmers, look, you already planted on all four parcels or all six parts of your land. You already covered your whole land. Plow under or turn over a certain area. Like They basically said, look, you've got to just stop that stuff from growing. Now, many farmers did. In fact, I can give you a, an actual number on that. Uh, Ten million acres were plowed under and farmers collected over $100 million in benefit payments as a result of this. Okay, Now, as the AAA is being debated in Congress, it's very big news. In the newspapers, everybody in the country that pays attention to the news knows about this, this bill and what it's supposed to do and so on. And as this big drama is going on in Congress, as they're arguing over the Agricultural Adjustment Act, a train arrives in Chicago at the stockyards, where all the livestock is brought in, cows and pigs and chickens and everything, right, to be slaughtered and turned into meat. And one of these trains has a mechanical malfunction, and a couple of the cars come open, the ramps go down, and 300 young pigs escaped into the streets of Chicago, running for their lives. Okay? Now, when I say young pigs, I'm talking about like this. Not a tiny little piglet like a puppy, but not a great big sow, like half as big as a hippopotamus, okay? But kind of like a young teenage pig with these long legs and big ears. I mean, it's the cutest looking thing in the world, right? So they escape off into the streets of Chicago. The people in these lower class neighborhoods know about the AAA, and they assume that these are pigs that are going to be slaughtered anyway because they're going to the slaughterhouse. And so they get all worked up, and they sort of grab the pigs and bring them in and turn them into pets, and the cops are trying to get them, and the people are, like, resisting it. There's this big battle on the streets of Chicago over trying to keep these pigs from being slaughtered. This becomes huge national headlines. Roosevelt saying, good Lord, I'm trying to save the economy. I'm trying to save farming, and people are, <laughs> are fighting me over pigs. But, yeah, this is what happens. What's really ironic about this is that Walt Disney had released the cartoon, The Three Little Pigs, just before the election of 1932. And one of the most popular songs of that year was Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? If you're not familiar with it, go on YouTube. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf, the big bad wolf? Well, when Roosevelt was running for the presidency, this song was used as like his theme song. They would play this over loudspeakers when he went out to give a talk or was being introduced or whatever. And the reason was is that people looked at the story of the three little pigs as a kind of allegory of what was happening to the country. Okay? They may be saying, yeah, what are you what are you talking about here? Well, okay, if you know the story of the three little pigs, it goes like this. There was one little pig that had a house of straw, and one had a house of wood, and one had, the guy over here on the right, a house made of bricks. You see him standing on the bricks with the trowel in his hand, right? And there was this big bad wolf. And he came to the house made of straw, and he huffed and he puffed, and he blew it all down, and this pig lost his house. The pig escaped and ran to the, the next pig's house who had a wooden house. But the wolf came and he blew the wooden house down. The two pigs escaped. They ran to the brick house. No matter how much the wolf huffed and puffed, he could not blow the brick house down. And so the story ends with the three little pigs happy and dancing out there on the walkway. And they've been saved, right? So when people saw this on some unconscious level, they said, you know, the depression is the wolf. And the brick house is the New Deal, this thing that Roosevelt is doing. This, this is it. This is the story of what's happening to us. It became this, this sort of deeply felt, very powerful message, if you will, by way of this little cartoon and this song. I just think it's kind of ironic that, you know, the AAA was almost derailed by this drama that was in all the newspapers around the country of the pigs in Chicago when it was the Three Little Pigs. It was uh, such an essential part of the, the symbolism of the New Deal. Now... The AAA was not 100% successful, uh, but it was successful as it needed to be because it helped to save farming. It didn't help every farmer in quite the same way. Your book talks about this, but it was enormously successful, and it helped to lead to the passage of the Resettlement Act, 
to, which created the Resettlement Administration, which was getting farmers back on their land that they'd lost so they could get those farms back up and running again. It also led to the passage of the Farm Mortgage Relief Act, which helped to diminish dramatically the payments the farmers had to make on their mortgages so that they could, wouldn't lose their land. And So this is all good stuff, right? No, farming, out of the way. Banking, out of the way. We've talked about that. Let's now talk about jobs, okay? How is it that the federal government, that the New Dealers and FDR, how are they going to get people back to work? Okay, well, they create, over a couple of years, three enormous administrations were created. The WPA, the PWA, the CWA. The W in all three of those is works. The A in all three of those is administration, public works, civil works, works progress. All of these things were about creating, <clears throat> excuse me, jobs, okay? Here is what was accomplished under these works administrations over the course of about eight years. Eight and a half million people were employed. They built 650,000 miles of roads and highways. They put enough sewer piping under the ground to circle the earth 30 times. They built 100,000 bridges, 125,000 public buildings, 8,000 parks, 3,500 playgrounds, 1,000 airports, and 4,000 schools in rural areas and employed over 5,000 teachers to help keep those rural schools open. Extraordinary stuff, guys. Unbelievable stuff. When I'm driving around L.A. sometimes or some other part of the country, I, I sometimes ask myself, I just look around, and I think, what was here before the New Deal? I mean, those statistics, you think, was, it, was, was there a park? Was there a paved road? Was there any sewer systems? I mean, the New Deal created a tremendous amount of the infrastructure in the country today that we just we just take for granted, like, oh, it's always been here or whatever. No, it was a new deal to put it in, all right? Now, if you look at these these posters, you know, back here, these really great, really strong, powerful, and media kind of graphic designs, you know, these kind of masculine guys riveting and with the hammer in hand and these farmer and the worker, you know, like one guy's got a sledgehammer, the other guy's got a rake here in the middle. Work pays America, shaking hands, okay? If you look at this stuff, especially that central image, and then look at this, you can see the impact that the Mexican muralists of the 1920s and 1930s had upon American artists in the 1930s. Here's a famous mural by Diego Rivera called The Alliance of Peasant and Worker. It, it's basically the same image, right? You know, except that the two guys have switched sides. You've got a, a factory worker here on the left, the factories at the far left in the background. You've got a campesino or a peasant here with the big sombrero to keep the sun off of him while he works in the fields over here on the right. You see the farm over here in the background. These are sort of colossal titanic figures, almost like the gods of labor, the gods of farming, you know, connected to these sort of celestial figures up here in the sky. But it's, it's the imagery, okay, that I'm talking about in particular. Over here on the right, you see a detail from a famous mural about 60 feet wide, 40 feet high, by Diego Rivera. It's in Mexico City. Um, if you look on the right, you see Conrad Albrecht's mural called The New Deal from 1934. I haven't been able to find a color picture of it, unfortunately, so I've just got it for you in black and white. But look in the center. You see FDR in overalls, right, standing up as a kind of worker at the epicenter of a sort of scene of economic populism, all these people engaged in these various activities, building, doing, creating. Clearly, Abrizio and the other, or most, or a lot of the New Deal artists of the 30s were inspired by the post-revolutionary Mexican art of the 1920s and 30s. I could spend a lot of time on this, but we don't have the time. It's, it's really something interesting to look into. Look up the murals of Diego Rivera, um, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Alfaro Siqueiros. Uh, and you'll see what I mean, a lot of connections with, with American art. Here's an interesting image. It's, it's a poster. I can't get close enough on any of these things in terms of enlargement, guys. It just, the image blurs too much, you know. The, it's just not crisp enough to sort of focus on anything in particular. But in every state, there's something. In some states like Texas or California, there's a few somethings trying to give a sense of all of the extraordinary things that were accomplished by the Public Works Administration under the New Deal. And then there was another 
important part of these works progress administrations. I think it was under the WPA that the Federal Art Project was created. The Federal Art Project had within it, hang on just a second, let me get my right sheet here. The Federal Art Project had within it the Federal Writers Project. And the Federal Writers Project did a lot of things, but I think the most lasting and important thing they did was they produced for every state, every single state in the Union, they produced a guide. Okay, It was called the Sea America series. These guides were distributed. You could get them free Okay, by the United States Travel Bureau, which doesn't even exist anymore. But okay, get a load of the imagery, right? Again, this strong, powerful imagery. Each state, again, had a guidebook. In other words, no matter where you wanted to go in the United States, you could write to the U.S. Travel Bureau, or if you lived in a big city like New York or Chicago or L.A., you could go to the office there, and they would give you this book. The book was written by writers from the state in question. Usually the head writer in charge was a kind of famous writer. For example, for California, John Steinbeck of Mice and Men, East of Eden, Nobel Prize winner. John Steinbeck was in charge of the California volume. And the book was not only, not only told you the history of the state, but everything about the state that was interesting to see and maps and directions on how to get there and hotels that you could stay at on the good places to eat and so on and so forth. They produced 50, 50 state guides, 30 guides to big cities like San Francisco, like Chicago. Okay, um, They produced books on every ethnic group, including specific Indian peoples, books on baseball, books on general American history. It was tremendously successful, so successful, in fact, that by, like, after, by I think, 1945, 1946, when the Automobile Club of America was established, the Automobile Club took the Sea America books and they used them as the foundation or the template from which they created their tour books. I don't know if you guys are AAA members or your, your parents are. If you've got a car, guys, you should join the Auto Club. It's cheap and you get tremendous things out of it. I've been a member for like 30 years. Never regretted it. Anyway, one of the great things is you go to the Auto Club office, you can get a tour book on cities, on states, maps. These books are five, six, eight hundred pages, a thousand pages thick, some of them. More information than you can imagine. Really awesome. Okay, so you get this Federal Writers Project that produces this Sea America series as well as other things. And then you also had within the Federal Art Project. You had the Federal Artists Project and the Federal Theater Project, okay? Plays are being put on. Every play is advertised with some kind of really, like, interesting and sort of compelling, you know, very modern art. You had murals created all around the country. There's about 15 New Deal murals in downtown L.A. alone, down in the lobbies of big, famous old buildings. Okay, murals for the community. I'm not going to give you the artist and the names of these murals and etc. It it's just takes up too much time, but I just want you to get a sense visually, right, of the kinds of things that were being produced under the New Deal as far as the Federal Art Project goes. These, all, all these images I'm showing you are 30, 40, 50 feet wide. These are monumental works of art right, intended to inspire people, fire people up, make them think about something relative to the place that they live in, to the country, to what's happening in terms of current events and etc. Here's a tremendous mural celebrating the construction of the Hoover Dam. Okay, you know, awesome stuff here that's being produced. Here you see a graph that's showing the different parts of the Federal Art Project and how those areas, fine arts, practical arts, education, miscellaneous, are divided or broken down okay, into smaller subgroups in the employment, the numbers of people that are being employed as a result of this um, and by November 1936, right? Fantastic stuff here. The plays that were produced, a lot of the stuff had to do with American history. Rachel's Man was about the life of Andrew Jackson. Lincoln, everybody was crazy about Lincoln in the 1930s in a major way. There was a number of famous movies made about Lincoln, but a lot of plays, the Lincoln-Douglas debate, Abraham Lincoln, the great commoner, Out of the Wilderness, a folk festival of the New Salem years of Lincoln. All of these plays were put on and staged, <clears throat> excuse me, by the Federal Theater Project, and admission was free, okay? And the best part was that most of these plays went out into small towns and rural areas where people had never seen a play in their life, and they're not only seeing things like this, but they're seeing Shakespeare, they're seeing Marlowe, they're seeing, you know, Eugene O'Neill, Chekhov, like all the great playwrights 
in history, the ancient Greeks, Aristophanes, Sophocles, etc. It's tremendous. Haiti was a play about the Haitian Revolution in the early 1800s against France, led by Toussaint L'Ouverture, who was called the Black Napoleon. An amazing subject for the 1930s and performed by black actors. Under the Federal Arts Project, you also had the very first time, for the first time ever, you had a black playing the lead in Shakespeare's Othello. It's about a black guy, but historically the black guy was played by a white guy. No, they had it by a black guy. And Orson Welles, who you may or may not have heard of, heard of uh, was the director of this play before he became a famous film director. You also had tremendous numbers of posters being produced to, to pump up interest in, in the public libraries, to fire people up about education, broadening their minds. If you don't have a job, you got too much time on your hands, you're down in the dumps, read a book, right? Open your mind, you know, broaden your horizons. You see over here on the right, books are weapons. Read about the Negro and national defense, Africa and the war, Negro history and culture. You've got plays that are being produced that are directly reflecting what's happening in the headlines okay, of the day. There was not enough decent housing in big cities like New York, Chicago, and there was this phrase that became popular, one-third of a nation is not properly housed. Well, it wasn't that dramatic. It wasn't 40 million people, okay? But over here on the left, you can see a poster talking about the need for better housing because of infant mortality. On the right, the need for better housing because we can eliminate crime that way. And then you get this play, One Third of a Nation, that's all about the problem of, you know, uh, inadequate housing for the people of the United States. The next thing that was established, or not the next thing, but something else that was established actually early on in the New Deal was something called the Civilian Conservation Corps. Hang on a second, I need to recall, guys. The CCC. And what the CCC specialized in was employing young men to get things done that were of use for the country. Okay, so by 1935, the Civilian Conservation Corps had employed over 500,000 young men. These young men thinned out 4 million acres of trees. They built more than 30,000 wildlife shelters. They created roads, a network of roads through the densest... The, the most densely forested regions of the United States. They built lookout towers so that forest fires could be could be reported quickly, like creating those roads and the wildlife shelters for animals. It was all about trying to deal with the problems of forest fires. All right. Um, they also planted trees. Here's an interesting statistic: of all the forest planting in the history of the nation, the Civilian Conservation Corps planted half of those trees in the decade of the 1930s. Okay. It's amazing stuff. It's extraordinary stuff. They had these huge dormitories, right? Here's the mess hall where the guys got three meals a day or two meals a day. They're in the mess hall. They'd eat lunch out on the road or wherever it was that they were working. Here they are. Picture these guys hard at work. So basically what you've got is you have the New Dealers working as hard as they can to think about ways to stimulate economic growth, to save farming, save banking, save industry, get people working, creating demand, right? Creating tax revenues. Here's FDR at a Civilian Conservation Corps camp, you know, went in and had lunch with these guys and, you know, everybody around FDR is always smiling. They've got this, you know, he's got this, this personality, this energy that just kind of bleeds into other people, the same way that Theodore Roosevelt had. So, Here's a kind of a nice image of FDR there, all right? And then this is kind of interesting. It's a, a map that shows you all of the camps of the CCC. These are all the places around the country where civilian conservation corps camps are set up to do this or that or whatever. If it seems largely concentrated in the eastern part of the country, that's because the overwhelming number of the people of the United States lived in the eastern part of the country in the 1930s. The West was still largely... Um, pretty thin in terms of population, except right on the West Coast. Okay, so we're going to talk about the election of 1936 when we come back, but for the moment, we are done. <laughs>